Okay, I'm gonna start. Uh, welcome everyone. Thank you for coming back to another Davis e-lecture. Um, uh, we appreciate uh, all viewership. Oh, somebody's got some feedback. There we go. <laughs> Little technical difficulty. Um, I'm the administrative director for CHAZ here at the University of Chicago. CHAZ is a health policy services research center that's been developing and disseminating innovative health policy and services research for over 70 years. Uh, as you know, COVID-19 uh, has been a global health pandemic that has rapidly changed how we live and work. Um, we have decided to move the e-lecture series to virtual format and viewership has been a wonderful response. Thank you again for attending today. Uh, after my remarks, Chaz co-director and SSA professor Harold Pollack will introduce today's presenter, postdoctoral social sciences teaching fellow in the Department of History and the college, Topher Kendall. To keep continuity and to allow the presenter to focus on speaking, we'll be fielding questions online in the Q&A section of Zoom only. Chat will be disabled. Today's, a copy of today's PowerPoint will be available on the CHAZ website at chaz.uchicago.edu. And I'm going to click record now and pass the mic to SSA Professor Harold Pollack to introduce today's speaker. Thanks. Um Thanks so much, Keith. Uh, it's such a pleasure to uh, uh, to be at this lecture today and uh, to introduce uh, Topher uh, Kendall. I, I since since his mom is not on the uh, uh, is not on the Zoom call, I'm going to be brief in describing the many accolades that he has. Uh, but I'll just say that that Topher is currently a, a postdoctoral uh, social science teaching fellow in the Department of History and the College. Uh, and he got his PhD uh, uh, here in 2019. And, and his dissertation is the, called The Sanitary Sieve, Public Health, Infectious Disease and the Urbanization of Hawaii, 1850 to 1914. And it's one of these things where we were just chatting before the call began how you know, one, one does a dissertation and it seems like something that's really interesting, but, uh, but not, obviously topical and all of a sudden wow this is obviously topical and uh it is uh this historical perspective is just fascinating on quarantine vaccinations and, and economics uh in this and i, I can't wait to uh, to hear topher's talk and it is part of uh, uh of a manuscript it's chapter three of his his manuscript which is called the sanitary sieve public health mobility and the making of the urban pacific world 1850 to 1920, and uh, and, and I, I will certainly buy this when it comes out. But uh, with that, Topher, I'm going to hand it over to you, and uh, just really looking forward to this uh, uh, to this lecture. Cool. Um, thank you, uh, Professor Pollock, for the introduction. Um, so, as you mentioned, this particular talk uh, comes from the third chapter of my current book manuscript. Uh, that chapter in particular focuses on the history of smallpox um, as uh, the native Hawaiian population is in decline and as Chinese immigrants um, are being brought into Hawaii for plantation labor. Um, this is just one very short section of that chapter. Um, so I'm going to do my best to try and contextualize it. Um, and then uh, I'm more than happy at the end of this talk to uh, sort of speak more broadly about my dis uh, about my book manuscript um, and how this particular talk fits into that. Um, so with that, let's get started. Um, <clears throat> so in the hot summer months of 1868, a virulent strain of smallpox besieged San Francisco. Within a year, the disease would infect nearly 2,000 San Franciscans and claim more than 750 lives, making it the deadliest urban epidemic to strike 19th century California. Yet smallpox was neither unique nor confined to the Golden State's fastest growing city. According to one local health official, the disease was spreading throughout Northern California, 
And in each instance, it was identified as the same malignant type that characterized the epidemic in San Francisco. If smallpox could decimate one community after another as it hitchhiked along lengthy overland trails, might it also transcend vast oceanic barriers? Those living in the mid-Pacific seaport of Honolulu certainly thought so. News that smallpox was ravaging California sparked trepidation among public health officials, politicians, and businessmen in Hawaii, and for good reason too. 15 years earlier, smallpox had traveled from Gold Rush, California to the Hawaiian Kingdom, paralyzing the archipelago's nascent economy and killing an estimated 6,000 to 10,000 indigenous Hawaiians within a year. Such devastation haunted the memories of those who survived. Of more immediate concern, however, was a monthly mail service between San Francisco and Honolulu, which the westward gazing United States had negotiated at the end of 1867. In September of that year, the SS Idaho completed her first westward voyage in 11 days and 20 hours. With a permanent steamship line in place, direct communication between San Francisco and Honolulu was now faster, more frequent, and more reliable than ever before. According to health officials in Hawaii, this novel connection would, quote, doubtless increase the number of visitors landing in Honolulu. As such, heightened vigilance was needed to prevent the introduction of infectious diseases, end quote. What was once deemed a harbinger of Hawaii's future prosperity was quickly devolving into a potential public health and commercial liability. After all, by the early autumn months of 1868, California's burgeoning smallpox epidemic was now less than 12 days away from Honolulu. Scholars exploring the history of infectious diseases in Hawaii and the broader Pacific world have often focused on colonial encounters, the advent of Christian missionaries, and the depopulation of indigenous peoples of the early 19th century. Far less explored, however, is the relationship between smallpox, commerce, and the institution of public health in the 1860s and 1870s, a transformative era for Hawaiian and Pacific world history that was characterized by rapid urbanization, the advent of Trans-Pacific steamships, and the enhanced mobility of migrant laborers. When considered together, these interrelated circumstances overexposed the Hawaiian archipelago to virulent diseases. As a result, the multitude of historical actors, from health officials and businessmen to native Hawaiians and Chinese immigrants, clashed over the most effective methods for safeguarding Honolulu from smallpox. Such controversies pivoted on the perceived and actual efficacy of two distinct public health measures that had become increasingly institutionalized by the mid 19th century, maritime quarantine and universal vaccinations. On the one hand, a strict quarantine could prevent the introduction of smallpox, but only at the cost of impeding commercial trade. On the other hand, vaccinations could immunize an entire population thus rendering quarantine measures obsolete. Yet in reality, vaccinations often proved inadequate due to the volatility of early inoculation techniques and racialized tensions between Western medicine and indigenous and immigrant cultures. For the remainder of this talk, I want to discuss three things. The first is urban vaccination programs, the second is rural vaccination programs, and the third is maritime quarantine laws. The microhistory that unfolds, I argue, illuminates a number of interlocking developments of the mid to late 19th century. Namely, the solidifying commercial connections between Pacific seaports, the burgeoning economic salience of Honolulu, the political and commercial pressures increasingly placed on public health officials, and most importantly, the inherent fallibility of public health measures. So in October 1868, the Hawaiian Board of Health was preparing for the worst. The board, which was composed of American and European physicians who had emigrated to Hawaii, had convened an emergency meeting to devise, quote, energetic preventive measures aimed at the vaccination or revaccination of the people of Honolulu. Leading the charge was Dr. William Hillebrand, 
a German expatriate of nearly two decades and the director of the Queen's Hospital, the first and only medical facility in Hawaii at the time. Hillebrand and his colleagues would focus their efforts on Honolulu, for it was the primary commercial conduit connecting the outer islands of Hawaii to the broader Pacific world. In theory, a fully immunized urban population would serve as a buffer against the foreign introduction and inter-island diffusion of smallpox. Accordingly, Hillebrand's team launched a systematic vaccination campaign by partitioning Honolulu into eight separate districts, converting a number of private practices into vaccine dispensaries and disseminating leaflets and posters across town to galvanize public support and inform residents of vaccination schedules. In mid 19th century Hawaii, immunizations were carried out in one of two ways. The first method, which Hawaiian health officials referred to as variolation, required the use of desquamated scabs or vaccine crusts from those who had recently contracted smallpox. No reported case of the disease had surfaced in Honolulu since the 1850s, so health officials were forced to import scabs from abroad, in this case from San Francisco, the same city that threatened Honolulu's well-being. With vaccine crusts in hand, a vaccinator would pulverize the specimen using a knife and a few drops of water to reduce the material into a, quote, homogeneous viscid pulp. A series of surface level incisions were then made on a patient's arm using a pulp laden lancet. Variolation was deemed successful if pustules formed in place of each incision within eight days of the initial operation. The procedure was administered to three or four individuals during a single session, quote, to ensure that a full supply of lymph would be available at all times. At this juncture, vaccination, vaccinators would begin the second method of immunization, formerly known as vaccination. So at this point, it's important to note that in the 21st century, both of these procedures are officially known as variolation, but in the mid 19th century in Hawaii, health officials didn't necessarily distinguish between the, or health officials did distinguish between the two, um, but they also seem to have used the terms interchangeably. Um, so uh, at this point, a variolated patient with well-developed pustules would return to their vaccinator eight days after the procedure uh, to have their arms harvested for lymph. In the process, vaccinators would puncture each pustule with a lancet and transfer the lymph to the arm of an unvaccinated individual. Eight days later, vac vaccinators would repeat the procedure, this time using lymph from recently vaccinated individuals rather than imported scabs or lymph from variolated patients. Health officials hoped that serial arm-to-arm -arm immunizations would result in a population of self-generating and self-sustaining lymph donors, thus negating the need to import vaccine crusts from abroad. To be sure, Hillebrand's urban vaccination campaign was not foolproof. Problems often arose as a result of technical, temporal, or organizational complications. For instance, fresh lymph had a shelf life of less than 24 hours, particularly in a humid climate like Hawaii's. So vaccinators were forced to stagger their patients' follow-up appointments to, quote, keep up a fresh and successive reservoir of lymph. In other words, a rudimentary calculus of supply and demand in the form of vaccinated and unvaccinated individuals often dictated the utility of fresh lymph and the ability to sustain an uninterrupted vaccination program. Hillebrand also lamented that, quote, confining the natives of each district to their appointed vaccinator was nearly impossible for patients often swarmed dispensaries more centrally or conveniently located to their own homes. As a result, some physicians were able to administer more than 2,500 vaccinations over a two month period, while others conducted less than 700 operations. Yet idle vaccinators or congested dispensaries paled in comparison to what Hillebrand described as the really weak point in the campaign. That is the perceived defiance of Honolulu's growing Chinese population. 
which totaled about 500 individuals by 1868. Few surrendered to the Lancet, he grumbled, for it was, quote, well known with what prejudice they regarded the operation in question. Many Chinese had survived smallpox or endured traditional inoculation before uh, emigrating from China. But according to Hawaiian health officials, a considerable majority of those arriving in Honolulu were still at risk of contracting and thus disseminating the disease. How Honolulu's Chinese community could be, quote, compelled or persuaded to submit to this protective measure, Hillebrand predicted, was a, was a burden that future health officials would have to bear as increased labor immigration loomed on the horizon. Obstacles aside, Hillebrand and his colleagues soldiered on. Campaign records for October and November of 1868 reveal that physicians attended to 7,600 Honoluluans. Of, and that is saying quite a lot considering the size of Honolulu at the time was around 14,000 uh, people. So they were able to vaccinate more than 50% of the city. So of these 7,600 Honoluluans, nearly 30% were first time vaccinees, while the remaining 70% were re-vaccinees who had received their first operation during the epidemic of 1853. According to contemporary American medical knowledge filtering into Hawaii by way of trained physicians and medical journals, the protective power of vaccinations diminished over time while revaccinations were more likely to succeed if the potency of the initial vaccination had already dissipated from the body. Looking back at his records, Hillebrand estimated that nearly 2,500 revaccinations had failed over the course of their most recent campaign, suggesting two things. The first is that 2,500 patients had retained their immunity to smallpox. And the second is that the remaining 3,000 urbanites had unwittingly lost their immunity to the disease sometime during the previous 15 years. Honolulu may have been ripe for reinfection, but Hillebrand still considered his urban vaccination campaign successful, given the sheer number of operations his team had conducted. Throughout the outer islands of Hawaii, however, vaccination procedures were more chaotic. For traveling physicians like Dr. David Lee, a seasoned medical professional educated and trained in Ohio, a host of problems arose some real and others exacerbated by prejudice and a particular strain of 19th century scientific racism. Complications typically ranged from the archipelago's fragmented geography and the difficulty of implementing old vaccination laws to the degeneration of vaccine crusts, all of which I'm happy to elaborate on at the end of my talk for anyone who's interested. Yet today I wanna to focus on Lee's characterization of Native Hawaiians, namely the supposed negligence of indigenous adults and the allegedly inferior quality of lymph taken from indigenous bodies. So as San Francisco's smallpox epidemic intensified at the end of 1868, Lee was transferred to the island of Maui uh, with vaccine crusts collected from those who had been recently immunized in Honolulu on the island of Oahu. After a number of failed attempts, Lee finally vaccinated 790 individuals by mid-December. Such progress was short-lived, however, as the rate of vaccination rapidly declined within a month. The reason he proclaimed was the, quote, culpable carelessness of indigenous parents who failed to bring their recently vaccinated children to follow up exams at appointed times and places. As a result, Lee could neither verify the overall efficacy of his efforts nor rely on a constant supply of lymph. Lee thus suggested making a, quote, wholesome example of several delinquents which he believed would have a most salutary effect and perhaps in the end, save many lives. For the late 1860s, the criminalization of a particular cross-section of Hawaiian society, in this case, the indigenous parents of susceptible children was by no means unique. This is especially true when considered alongside concurrent efforts to contain other diseases like syphilis and leprosy which often amounted to 
formal registration programs, imprisonment, and even banishment to the most isolated regions of the archipelago. Also problematic was the perceived indifference of Native Hawaiian authority figures charged with enforcing compulsory vaccination laws. Unsupervised constables, Lee complained, not only, quote, put forth futile efforts like bell ringing uh, to remind those within earshot to attend scheduled vaccination days, but also, quote, refused to apply legal remedies to transgressors. Taking matters into his own hands, Lee recruited his own personal police officer, a quote, rather intelligent native who was able to assuage the fears of skeptical islanders and maintain comprehensive records of those immunized. So very briefly, these are vaccination records from uh, the island of Oahu. I cannot find actual vaccination records from the island of Maui. But if you look at the PowerPoint, you can see that on the left-hand side, uh, there is a date with um, a list of uh, locations around the island of Oahu. And then you will see two columns, fathers and mothers, and under each are names of uh, fathers and mothers of children that then appear on the second page where it says boys and girls. Um, the paper itself, when I found it in the archives, was exceptionally thin, and so it might be a little difficult to actually read this because the ink bleeds through. Um, but I think it's fair to assume that vaccination records that were held on Oahu are probably quite similar to vaccination records that were held on other islands in the Hawaiian archipelago. Most troubling, however, was Lee's conviction that indigenous bodies were inherently unable to produce viable lymph and thus unfit as a communal reservoir for arm-to-arm -arm vaccinations. In a series of letters sent to Hillebrand back in Honolulu, Lee alleged that, quote, a pure native rarely exhibited a legitimate smallpox pustule in any stage of their body's immune response. But why? According to Lee, the quote, blood of these people, particularly the unmixed natives, was so corrupt and so filled with disease that, lump, that once lymph was infused into their systems, it assimilated with the latent scrofulous and syphilitic humors of their blood. This in turn blighted the potency of any lymph and increased the possibility of transmitting bloodborne diseases like syphilis and leprosy from quote, native to native. It thus became standard practice for Lee to use lymph or scabs from patients he deemed, quote, the most healthy persons or those who were almost wholly half white plus Chinese or in some cases half black. Using this particular classification of lymph was far superior than, quote, the best scabs or lymph from a pure native, he avowed. For Lee, it was the complete exclusion of the inherently dirty and diseased Hawaiian body rather than the partial inclusion of the non-Hawaiian body that ensured the overall success of arm-to-arm -arm vaccinations. So this is an image of, I think it's the SS California, uh, which appeared directly after the SS Idaho. I don't, I have never been able to find an image of the SS Idaho, but this is what Trans-Pacific steamships of the late 1860s and early 1870s looked like. So the intended benefits of these urban and rural vaccination campaigns would be put to the test in December of 1868 when the SS Idaho arrived in Honolulu from San Francisco carrying a confirmed case of smallpox aboard. According to statements taken from passengers and crew members, the quote sick man, a Spaniard employed as a pantry man, had departed San Francisco in good health. Three days out from Honolulu, blisters erupted across the man's body forcing him to self-isolate within the ship's forecastle. Prior to this development, a period in which the disease was still transmissible, the patient wandered freely throughout the ship and prepared communal meals for various passengers. <clears throat> Despite flying a yellow flag to signal the presence of smallpox, the Idaho was permitted to dock in Honolulu upon its arrival. Subsequent decisions concerning the mobility of those on board were left to Dr. Ferdinand Hutchinson, the president of the Hawaiian Board of Health and the Minister of the Interior. So our equivalent of um, the, uh, 
department of, I don't know, um, but we'll move on from that. Um, so to contain the disease, Hutchinson had the patient removed to Quarantine Island and prohibited crew members and steerage passengers from disembarking. Yet at the same time, he liberated the captain, purser, and wealthy cabin passengers once they agreed to, quote, dress in a fresh suit of clothes and report themselves to the port physician for the next two weeks in case of any sickness. To make matters worse, reports surfaced that detained crew members had crept ashore on Christmas Eve, roamed around town, and were, quote, afterwards arrested and confined at the police station where they mingled with other detainees until the following morning. While smallpox never actually materialized beyond the Idaho, the, uh, the fallibility of quarantine procedures alongside Hutchinson's own inconsistencies triggered public outrage. Within days, a committee of foreign and native businessmen petitioned the government for Hutchinson's resignation, claiming that his actions had endangered the public's health and quote, injured the reputation of Honolulu in the commercial marts of other countries with which this country has business relations. In the, indeed, those with a vested interest in Hawaii's economic well being knew that a single medical misstep placed thousands of lives at risk and, in the process, undermined Honolulu's emerging commercial importance within the Pacific world. But Hutchinson sidestepped any discussion of stepping down and instead delivered a rather snide response in the Hawaiian Gazette a local news, uh, newspaper that, and the de facto mouthpiece of the government. Quote, I am gratified to know that the public is aware of the government's active measures to prevent the introduction and spread of smallpox, he retaliated. Yet instead of organizing public gatherings or theatrical calls for his resignation, Hutchinson believed the most effective way to support the Board of Health and the lives and livelihoods of the community at large was quote, by carefully attending to the duty of vaccination, each for himself, his family, friends, and neighbors. To be sure, this was more than a dis dismissive negation of the business community's petition. It was also a direct confession that Hutchinson and his colleagues did in fact believe in the protective powers of vaccination, or did, did they believe that the protective powers of vaccination were superior to those of quarantine. Yet Hutchinson also understood the need for immediacy if smallpox once again threatened Hawaii in the foreseeable future. Whereas universal vaccination was labor intensive, time consuming and geographically dispersed, particularly in Hawaii, quarantine measures could be mobilized on the spot and in response to an imminent threat. Acknowledging that the Idaho affair was an omen of things to come, the Board of Health devised a new set of quarantine regulations in early 1869. If a vessel arrived from an infected seaport, it would be quarantined unless 15 days had elapsed from the time of its departure. Notably, this time frame was one day longer than the known incubation period for smallpox. For instance, if a vessel traveled from San Francisco to Honolulu in 12 days, it would be automatically quarantined for an additional 72 hours to ensure that no new cases had developed in the interim. Alternatively, if the disease emerged during the vessel's voyage, the ship and its human cargo would be quarantined for 15 days upon its arrival, 14 days to allow for incubation and an additional day just for good measure. To effectively prevent the foreign introduction of smallpox, quarantine laws had to impose a biologically determined timeframe on the mobility of people and goods. Put another way, when quarantine measures were followed to the letter, the medically accepted incubation period of smallpox dictated the duration of trans-Pacific trade. This resurgent interest in quarantine did not sit well uh, with every health official in Honolulu, most notably William Hillebrand. A quote, rigid and strict quarantine would have paralyzing effects on trans-Pacific trade and Hawaii's local economy, he argued. Bustling cities in East Asia, the South Pacific, and the American West were able to maintain um, vibrant, quote, commercial relations with the whole world. They boasted an almost unlimited variety of industries and branches of trade, and would thus be little affected by a temporary interdiction of their commerce with a single country, 
but how would Hawaii fare under similar circumstances if a vast majority of the nation's economy was, quote, altogether dependent upon a market in Pacific seaports where the smallpox never dies out? The financial consequences were undeniable. An over-reliance on quarantine would undermine Hawaii's commercial prosperity while tarnishing Honolulu's international reputation as both a budding agricultural entrepot and a reliable way station for seafaring vessels that crossed the Pacific. So the drama of the Idaho affair also epitomized the various structural flaws and human errors intrinsic to maritime quarantine. Smallpox might evade one seaport after another via unfumigated luggage and mailbags, fugitives uh, attempting to escape quarantine facilities, or well-connected passengers circumventing isolated isolation measures. But before a fully vaccinated community, Hillebrand argued, smallpox, quote, withered into a harmless foe. The best course of action for Honolulu, he concluded, would be, could be summarized using a simple maxim, quote, keep your house in order. In other words, a fully immunized urban population was the Hawaiian Islands' first line of defense against the introduction and diffusion of smallpox. Even if the disease transcended municipal borders, Hillebrand speculated, rural vaccinations were progressing as fast as circumstances would permit. Given the gradual headway made by Lee and other traveling physicians on the outer islands, Hillebrand deemed it safe to assume that the island of Oahu would be fully protected within a month and by mid-March, so too would the whole archipelago. Ultimately, Hillebrand's unwavering conviction that universal vaccinations represented the only effective path forward was indeed short-lived. Maritime quarantines to safeguard against the physical and economic ravages of smallpox would persist well into the early 20th century, and the tensions between quarantine laws and vaccination programs would follow suit. Put another way, either, uh, each public health measure served as a de facto backup plan in case the other faltered, a symbiotic relationship that public health officials would come to embrace as an ever-growing number of commercial trade routes connected Honolulu to seaports embedded within a thriving Pacific world economy. Thank you. Thanks, Thanks Topher. Topher. Yeah, go ahead, Harold. No, Keith, uh, feel free, I'll, then I'll jump in. No, I was just gonna say thank you. And uh, one of the things that I really enjoy about this research project is um, the comparative history to what's going on right now. I mean, it's um, really fascinating. Harold, do you have any questions? Yeah, uh, it is. Uh, yeah, this is exactly as, as, as you say, the type of historical analysis that seems totally buried in the past until it's not. Uh, <laughs> the, um, uh, I mean, I'll start off with one question sort of from the current day. If, if, if Governor Pritzker brought you in his office and he said, you know, we have different parts of the state that are, that have that are questioning the value of some of the public health measures that the public health community is asking me to take. And I'm trying to understand how to navigate these different constituencies. Does a historical perspective give me any useful guidance? Uh, what, would you, what would you say to him? Oh, goodness, that is a loaded question. It, um, <clears throat> well, uh, so unrelated to this particular topic, um, but still related to infectious diseases. A couple of weeks ago, I was actually asked to um, uh, do an interview with a couple of local publications uh, in Chicago about mm -hmm. the 1918 Spanish flu epidemic, uh, pandemic, mm -hmm. and sort of the ways in which Chicago reopened um, after that pandemic. And, you know, the one thing I can say is that in 1918 and often in times before that and times after that with regard to other diseases, uh, we've always opened too soon. Um, there is always a resurgence of the disease, um, whether it be in Chicago or whether it be in Honolulu or New York. Um, and 
the complaints are consistent across time. Um, the complaints are, we are losing money. Um, we can't conduct our businesses. Uh, you are placing lives above livelihoods. Uh, but in the end, livelihoods are just as important as lives because lives can't exist without livelihoods. Um, I think that a historical perspective provides us with the type of information we need to actually make uh, sound decisions because we have examples of this not working in the past when we are when we rush to reopen. Um, so I'll, I'll leave it at that. There, um, let's see, Seth, uh, Seth mm -hmm. Archer uh, uh, has a hand up. I don't know if, it, Seth, do you want to put your question in the um, in the question box or, uh, or Keith, can Seth, uh, uh, how, what's the best way to, interf to interface with Seth? Uh, yeah, he, he should submit his question in the Q&A box. The hand raising, I'll recognize it, but it doesn't enable microphones. There, um, uh, how, uh, Jose Zayas asks, how long did they wait to reopen? Uh, in Chicago or in uh, Hawaii? Uh, you know, the question just came in. So okay. uh, Jose, did you mean Chicago or did you mean Hawaii? I'm gonna, I'm gonna assume it's Chicago. Um, yeah. Chicago, Chicago. So they chose to reopen about six weeks after they um, put social distancing in place um, and like self-isolation measures. Um, and uh, yeah, so in Chicago, it actually worked out relatively well compared to other cities. Um, but that's because Chicago was sort of ahead of the curve and put uh, public health measures in place at an early stage in the local epidemic. Other cities like Philadelphia, for example, did not. They waited too long. And so they had to extend their stay at home orders and shelter in place orders much, much longer. Um, so in Chicago, it was about six weeks. There's a question from a Louise Kendall, which is quite a coincidence. Yeah, uh, <laughs> did, did, did common folk back then rebel against the quarantine? And I, I assume that's in Hawaii. Yeah. So. Not necessarily. Well, I mean, even in, in this particular uh, instance in 1868, I don't necessarily know if I would consider it rebelling. Um, but th I mean, th there's evidence of uh, wealthy individuals getting out of quarantine, being able to essentially wiggle their way off of the ship because they are well connected. In other instances, the circumstances are much more dire. So uh, by the 1880s, when um, these massive steamships are coming into Honolulu and they have hundreds of Chinese immigrants aboard uh, that come into Honolulu and then get dispersed throughout the islands um, for plantation labor purposes. Um, <clears throat> when those ships come in and there are cases of smallpox on board, those ships are isolated in the harbor. They're detached from the shoreline and no one is allowed on board and no one is allowed off board. Now that is done for as long as is necessary. So it can happen for uh, a couple of weeks. And then if someone has smallpox on board, it gets extended another two weeks because they have to make sure that the incubation period hasn't provided, uh, hasn't sort of um, emerged elsewhere among those on board. And so once you've completed a two or three week long journey across the Pacific Ocean, and then you're put in quarantine for another two weeks or another month, people get very agitated, um, especially when you're living in close quarters. And so there are a number of cases of uh, Chinese immigrants um, rebelling against captains of these vessels. Um, there are cases of Chinese immigrants jumping overboard uh, and attempting to swim uh, across Honolulu Harbor to get on shore. Um, there's also a ton of cases of um, individuals who are taken off of vessels and placed on quarantine island. So, um, oops, sorry about that. Um, so, I think you can see from this. Um, where it says Honolulu Harbor, uh, quarantine island up there, it uh, was a makeshift uh, island where they would dredge material from the bottom of Honolulu Harbor and place it 
on this reef. And over time, it, was, it became this man-made island that they used to quarantine individuals. And um, there are staged rebellions in, uh, on Quarantine Island uh, as the, the population of Quarantine Island gets bigger and bigger during subsequent epidemics, whether it be for smallpox or cholera or other quarantinable diseases. Let me ask you, there's more questions in the box. One question I was wondering about, uh, so I, I basically fainted during your description of the imported scabs and the injection process. Uh, and I'm wondering about the role of disgust in the way, in the discourse around some of these diseases. It does seem to me that, that there's something, that many of the diseases that one could talk about, whether it's smallpox or syphilis, that there's an element of shame and disgust in in the symptoms and in the behaviors that might be in the case of STIs uh, uh, compared to say influenza where it's a respiratory thing that doesn't seem to come with any particular stigma around, doesn't have the same grossness to it in its uh, uh, other than in the, how sick people get when they get it. Uh, do we, th historically, do we treat diseases differently when they sort of trigger an intense disgust reaction in some capacity and maybe maybe more willing to racialize our view of this disease if there is something associated with it that that, that seems particularly disgusting yeah absolutely absolutely um, so from the in, in, in an American context and a Hawaiian context from the 1850s forward smallpox is deemed a Chinese disease. Um, and part of the reason for that is uh, when Chinese immigrants uh, initially came into places like San Francisco, they were not necessarily forced into Chinatown, but um, because of various sort of housing laws or just prejudice in general, they tended to congregate in a particular neighborhood. The same thing happened in Honolulu. There's a Chinatown in Honolulu. And um, often you would have overcrowding in these region, in these areas, uh, and the, the land itself would never get bigger. So you would just have more and more people pushed into the same size piece of land. And as a result of that, sanitation never, uh, never went well. And a disease like smallpox, there's a visual marker to it. Your, your face and your body erupts in pustules. And um, I think that because it spread more quickly within Chinese neighborhoods because of overpopulation, not because of Chinese individuals themselves, uh, in the 19th century, there was this sort of uh, perception that Chinese immigrants were responsible for it and that it it only made sense because they're already living in unsanitary and disgusting conditions. So of course they're going to contract a disease that is as disgusting as smallpox um, or so it, or so it went in the 19th century. So um, the, we just I'm just going to cut in because there's a bunch of questions uh, that, sure, that, sure. that are starting to pop in. One is uh, how were public institute help health institutions of the 19th century of Hawaii financed? Uh, was it uh, through wealthy benefactors or taxation? Uh, how were those? Uh, uh, how how were these? How was public health financed in Hawaii? It was through taxation. So the government had, the Hawaiian kingdom had um, its own treasury and uh, money would be allotted to, funds would be allotted to different departments in the Hawaiian kingdom. So you would have like the uh, Ministry of the Interior, the Ministry of Foreign Affairs, um, the Ministry of uh, Finance, um, and each of these ministries had subsequent boards underneath it. So um, like the Ministry of Foreign Affairs had a board of immigration underneath it, along with other boards. The Ministry of the Interior had a board of health. Um, in the 19th century, and I think even today, maybe up until very recently, um, the Board of Health, which later became the Department of Health, is the biggest department in Hawaii, in the state of Hawaii. So the Board of Health in the 19th century was the, the in the later 19th century, was the most important and often well-funded uh, 
uh, department in the Hawaiian kingdom. Um, and then depending on the types of uh, epidemics that it encountered, sometimes it would lose a lot of its money and it would go through dry spells where they weren't able to implement uh, sort of preventive public health programs. Thank you. There, um, there's so many questions here. Uh, were there any adaptations the government ultimately took to minimize the social or medical side effects of quarantine that they didn't originally consider? Um, yes. So. In 1881, there are five vessels from Hong Kong that come into Honolulu over the course of a month, and each one has upwards of 500 Chinese immigrants. It is like the moment in Hawaii where Chinese immigration sort of explodes and then drops back down. Um, as a result of this sort of constant connection with places around the Pacific Ocean, smallpox was brought into the Hawaiian kingdom by way of one of these vessels. Um, I think around 200 people ended up contracting the disease in and around Honolulu itself. And many of the individuals who lived in Honolulu were either uh, Chinese immigrants who lived in Chinatown, native Hawaiians who were scattered throughout the municipal area, and then a, a sizable handful of uh, foreigners from the United States or Europe. And as the smallpox epidemic broke out, Native Hawaiians were brought to Quarantine Island. Native Hawaiians who had uh, contracted smallpox were brought to Quarantine Island and isolated. One problem with that is there are um, uh, <clears throat> Native Hawaiians are, one of the problems with public health in Hawaii is that when you attempt to isolate individuals, Native Hawaiian culture sort of butts right up against that because the uh, objective is to help your loved ones as much as possible. It's to become the caretaker. And so public health officials end up allowing unvaccinated Native Hawaiians into Quarantine Island to serve as caretakers and nurses for those who were sick um, in an attempt to sort of accommodate Native Hawaiian populations in Honolulu. That's really, that's really interesting. There, um, uh, let's see, there's so many questions. But one question. Uh, uh, just a uh, reminder. To Topher has another appointment uh, coming up, and so maybe we have time for one more question. Okay. Yeah. Um, there. Um, uh, so, so, uh, uh, what were the methods of enforcement of quarantine or stay-at-home orders in both 1918 and Honolulu? That'll be that'll be our last question. I'm sorry, Seth and John and and Shanika, that we didn't uh, have a chance to get to your questions. I'll, I'll copy them and send them to the author. Yeah, please do. That would be great. Thank you. Um, so methods of enforcement. Uh, it depends on where you're looking. So if you have a vessel that emerge, that that comes into Honolulu with smallpox on board, the vessel would be sort of pushed out into Honolulu Harbor in open waters, um, detached from the shoreline and you were not allowed to have any communication with those vessels. Uh, no one on board those vessels could come into Honolulu and no one in Honolulu could go on board those vessels except for a select number of public health officials who would conduct inspections and investigations to make sure that people were healthy. Um, if you're looking at Quarantine Island, uh, people would be, if, if the vessel was small enough and had a, a lower number of passengers, they would be offloaded onto Quarantine Island so that the vessel could get on its way and continue sort of its economic journey across the Pacific Ocean. Um, <clears throat> or individuals, when you have an epidemic in Honolulu, individuals would be brought from their homes and placed on Quarantine Island so that they didn't infect those around them. Um, there are some instances though where epidemics actually uh, get so big that Quarantine Island is not useful. It can't hold that many people and uh, vessels themselves uh, can't hold that many people either. And so they end up um, basically imprisoning people in their houses, um, which 
is pretty common. It's something that uh, has happened throughout time. It's happened within the past few months uh, in various places around the world. Um, one could argue that maybe it's happening to us right now, um, even though we are allowed to leave and we are allowed to go for walks. Um, so in the 19th century, the attempt is much more forceful and it uses police power to make sure that it's enforced. Um, it's not sort of voluntary or left up to the individual to make decisions for themselves. It is left up to public health officials and police officers. Well, thank you so much, Topher. This has been really interesting and these maps are pretty awesome too. Uh, well, uh, I really learned a lot and uh, it is, uh, it's great to have a historical perspective on a, on a set of challenges we're currently facing that uh, uh, where we, uh, where the historical dimension is often lost. So uh, I just want to thank our speaker and thank Keith for uh, being the logistical impresario. And uh, Keith, is there any last uh, words that we want to uh, offer? No, the, um, we will uh, try to get those questions to Topher uh, following this re recording and um, the recording and the slides will be available on chaz.uchicago.edu. And thank you again, Topher. Thank you so much. I really appreciate the opportunity. And thank you to everyone out there. I can't see you, but I know you're there because you're asking questions. Thank you for attending. I really appreciate it. Yes. Thank you, everyone. Stay safe. Bye-bye, everyone.